Hello, my name is Nerida Campbell and I'm the Acting Head of Curatorial at Sydney Living Museums. It's not a stick up today, I'm back on site, joyously back on site at our museums as we gradually begin to reopen to the public. If you'd like to come and see us, please keep checking back on the uh, SLM website for updated times and properties that will be open. I'd like to begin by acknowledging the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation on whose land I live and currently work. I pay my respects to elders past, present and future. Curators of SLM are constantly discovering new stories about the people, places and things we care for at our 12 sites. During this talk series, we'll be sharing some of the research with you as we explore a range of subjects from food to furnishing textiles, from celebrity marriages to colonial bungalows. Join me every Tuesday at 4 till 4.30 to hear our curators delve into a new topic. Today's speaker is Dr. Scott Hill, who is currently the curator with special responsibility for house museums in the Western portfolio, which include Ralph's Hill Estate and Elizabeth Farm. As a teenager, Scott was captivated by pictures of ruins, trying to imagine how people had lived in these dramatic and crumbling spaces. This fascination led to his interest in historic architecture and how a house both reflected and recorded the lives of its past inhabitants. Now, if you have a question for Scott, add it to the Zoom chat and he will answer it at the end of his talk. Thanks, Scott. Thank you. And thank you, Nerida. Hello, everybody. Thank you for joining us today. Um, I'm coming to you today from Darug country um, in Rouse Hill in Sydney's Northwest. And today I'll be talking about the colonial bungalow. So first up, I'm just going to share my screen. Won't be a moment. There we go. Oops, sorry. Okay. Um, my talk today, Perfectly Pucker, The Colonial Bungalow. And actually what I might do is just stop my um, camera just while I'm speaking. Okay, Perfectly Pucker, The Colonial Bungalow. Um, the talk today is in three parts. Uh, first, we'll look at the origins of the word bungalow and what it originally meant. Uh, look at the Anglo-Indian bungalow and its variants. And then we'll have a look at the colonial bungalow, and especially in the context of Elizabeth Farm. And I've also put some uh, references and links into the comments that you can have a look at uh, for future reading as well. Both the definition and origin of the colonial bungalow is not exactly straightforward. It encompasses both architectural and spatial concepts, as well as a social context. While used freely by the British in India, it was not a term used commonly by colonists in New South Wales, where in the 1820s and 30s, a new housing type was being developed. As we'll see, however, the similarity to the Indian bungalow, the architectural form that so characterized British housing in colonial India is obvious. And as a consequence, the name Indian or Anglo-Indian bungalow is often heard when describing houses such as Elizabeth Farm. To what extent, however, the design of these Indian contemporaries actually influenced colonial building here is highly debatable. There were certainly close contacts between British India and New South Wales. They were mercantile and social. There were civilian, military and administrative staff traveling between the two. But there was also contact and direct experience with the West Indies, where the form was also evolving. Lachlan Macquarie, who was governor in the years the colonial bungalow appeared, came to Sydney from India, while his military aide de camp, Lieutenant John Watts, who designed the double colonnaded military hospital in Sydney, and the Lancer Barracks and General Hospital in Parramatta, had, for example, been stationed in the Caribbean. And to him can be attributed much of the look of Macquarie period civil buildings, civic buildings, with their single pitched roofs covering both structure and veranda. Sorry, I'm just having a, there we go. So to start at the very beginning, what, what exactly is an Indian bungalow? The origin of the word is captured in its name. It's derived from a word meaning a house type from or of Bengal. This refers to the region at the top of the Bay of Bengal, occupied today by the Indian state of West Bengal and the neighboring country of Bangladesh. 
the Bangla, Banglo, Bengalu, Bengali, Banglo, for until its English spelling became fixed, there were any number of variations of the word, referred to a local basic housing type that was quickly adopted and modified by the British, usually those attached to the East India Company who effectively ruled the region, ruled the region after 1758. And in this map of India in the early 1800s, you can see uh, the area of Bengal up at the top of the bay uh, and its capital Calcutta or Kolkata as it's now known. This early description of an Anglo-Indian bungalow at Lucknow by the artist William Hodges dates from 1783. And he says, bungalows are buildings in India generally raised on a base of brick, one, two or three feet from the ground and consist of only one story. The plan of them usually is a large room in the center for an eating and sitting room and rooms at each corner for sleeping. The whole is covered with one general thatch which comes low to each side. The spaces between the angle rooms are verandas or open porticos to sit in during the evenings. The center hall is lighted from the sides with windows and a large door in the center. Sometimes the center verandas at each end are converted into rooms. Uh, and you can see that as with bungalow, the spelling of the word veranda took quite some time to settle down. The bungalow's plain, quite rustic appearance, however, received mixed opinions. To Emma Roberts, writing in 1835, they bore, quote, a strong resemblance to an overgrown barn. While to Richard Burton in 1851, a bungalow was merely a modification of the cow house. This image of a large indigo planter's house shows a bungalow with a thatched pyramidal roof as traditional houses were often described. In 1849, Colesworthy Grant described how this typology was anglicized. And I quote, take for instance, the ground plan of the native's bungalow. The center square may consist of either one or two apartments according to the circumstances or wants of the individual, whilst the thatched roof extending considerably over all sides is supported at the extreme edges upon bamboo or wooden pillars, thus forming a covered veranda around the building. The European resident, improving upon this, encloses the veranda by erecting either a mat or a brick wall, and in like way, throwing partitions across the corners, converts the veranda into little rooms for the convenience of either of himself or visiting friends. The roof being carried beyond these as before would complete nearly all which exists in the European's bungalow of the present day. Rude as this may appear, these rustic tenements, in one of which I once spent a week, are generally not only very pretty, but very comfortable. Their thick straw roofs and airy locality rendering them cool habitations. And that was published in 1862. The indigenous bungalow described by Grant was a square plan with a pyramidal roof, though a rectangular layout became more common. Typically of straw thatch, the roof was of considerable size the steep pyramidal pitch needed to shed rainwater effectively. But the important feature he and other writers point out is the enclosure of the veranda corners to make small airy rooms. And this would become a standard feature of so many colonial houses in New South Wales, such as Elizabeth Farm or Glenfield. Internal rooms opening off each other could be added as in this plan with six bedrooms based on an 1835 description by Emma Roberts. You can instantly see how far removed it is from all British architectural typologies. The plan to the right, meanwhile, is drawn from another author and is a variation on the standard theme. It shows a semi-divided central room flanked by four bedrooms with adjoining dressing rooms, making small apartments, and again with bathrooms placed into the corners where the verandas have been enclosed. This uh, 1830s bungalow has a mix of roofing materials. And here you can see um, a small painting from the Caroline Simpson Library and Research Collection. And you can see that the central section of the roof is thatched straw, whilst there's an outer shallower, which is interesting, uh, tiled outer veranda. And if you notice at the extreme left, uh, the enclosed veranda corner. This drawing of a bungalow in Ceylon, now Sri Lanka, is a reminder that the bungalow form was quickly appearing in tropical colonies around the world, in Asia, Africa, and the Americas with great similarity. And if I had just changed the caption here, uh, this could have been anywhere in India or in the West Indies. It's pretty much identical to the example here on the left. 
whilst that on the right is what's referred to as a DAC or a DORC bungalow, which was the name given uh, by the Anglo-Indians for a European lodging house used in India on the routes between settlements. And in this one, you can see how the central section has actually been raised uh, so that small clerestory lights could provide extra light and ventilation in the center. And this brings us to Pucker. Still maintaining the basic spatial organization was a bungalow that was more costly, made of brick or stone, and that typically had a flat roof. And the word for this more substantial construction for a house with brick walls or columns, or even of a road paved in gravel or stone, entered our colloquial language as meaning high class and expensive, pucker. In this 1795 drawing, you can see a bungalow with pucker masonry walls and a combination of a pitched outer roof and a flat inner roof. Also note the, uh, the cane blinds extending onto the right, which provide extra shade to the verandas. And we use similar blinds today at Elizabeth Farm and they make the Eastern veranda a particularly delightful place to sit in summer. Hobson Jobson, which is quite a fascinating 19th century dictionary of Anglo-Indian words, defined pucker as pucker, adjective from the Hindi pucker, meaning ripe, mature, or cooked, and hence substantial, permanent, with many specific applications. One of the most common uses in which the word has become specific is that of building of brick and mortar, in contradistinction to one of inferior material as of mud, matting, or timber. And here we have a very pucker house indeed. Increasingly, while the bungalow typology was used for both Indian and European housing, it was often the materials that set them apart. Rendered brick, stone and tiled roofs were the hallmarks of a pucker European house, while kucha houses were of simpler mud brick and with thatch or choppered roofs. Pucker houses could also be two-storied and used the transplanted neoclassical style of European architecture. Uh, and using the transplanted neoclassical style of European architecture increasingly typify much official British housing of the mid and latter 19th century. And while we're not really looking at this, you know, the larger and grander villa form, um, I did want to include this 1840 view of a neoclassical villa from Madras as an example of the upper end of Anglo-Indian colonial housing uh, as a parallel to the bungalows and the villas in New South Wales that were coexisting at the same time. Um, large villas like Elizabeth Bay House, for instance. Which brings us now to the colonial bungalow in New South Wales. While in some instances, a direct link to India can be established, the colonial bungalow as we recognize it today was a form that naturally developed over three decades as the basic two and three roomed cottages of the colony's first years, first gained simple verandas attached to their exteriors, then had them built as integral parts of the structure combined under a single unbroken roof line then had their corners in enclosed to create smaller airy rooms. Voila, a bungalow. Aside from a physical and spatial similarity to their Anglo-Indian counterparts, the roof line embracing house and encircling veranda, uh, James Broadbent also makes a social distinction as to the New South Wales bungalow, the term used very much to refer to the residents of the wealthy and the estate owners. Uh, and this is in much the same way as the phrase cottage or nay, might be used to label the decorated cottage of the gentry to distinguish it from an everyday farmhouse. This definition, however, would preclude a large number of civil, military and commercial structures that are also in this bungalow form. Uh, and in particular, I look at the Lancer Barracks at Parramatta as an example. Elizabeth Farm remains today as the oldest surviving European house built in Australia. Begun in 1793, the year in which John MacArthur received an initial grant of 100 acres of land by the Parramatta River, it was extended and modified over the following 30 years. In its structure, it therefore records three decades of changes in planning and spatial thinking directed by its owner, John MacArthur, as it evolved from a generic British cottage into the bungalow form. Its original shingled roof is steep, nearly 45 degrees, a necessary pitch again to ensure that water was shed. At its core, 
and it's the section here outlined in red, uh, is a simple single piled plan. Uh, that means um, effectively only one room deep. Two large rooms flanking a vestibule with small offices behind, all under a roof with gabled ends. And what you then see uh, outlined in blue is the next large stage where the house extends outwards and really starts to develop that bungalow form. And the green to the right-hand side is the, then the added eastern veranda, which was added to the outside of the house again. So the house's first encircling veranda, and it's shown here by the red outlines on the left, simply abutted the top of the exterior walls. But it was what MacArthur created from 1826 to 27, however, that gives the house its far more sophisticated and decidedly genteel bungalow look, a new veranda roof that now started two thirds of the way up the incline of the main roof. And this is the one on the right-hand side shown in green. So you can see the area of the veranda roof has effectively doubled. The result was still a broken roof pitch distinct from most true Indian bungalows, but it was one that was broad and threw the visual emphasis onto the spreading horizontal form of the roof. Small corner rooms, the pretty little plant rooms or conservatories as MacArthur called them in 1826, were later created by enclosing the veranda ends. This was a simple way for a homeowner to add rooms to a building type that was otherwise difficult to extend. And I've just compared this uh, to the earlier view of the Indian bungalow. And as another comparison, here we have on the right uh, a sketch of a house called Vermont built in the 1830s. Uh, to the top then is its plan. And just for comparison, the plan of a contemporary house called Tali, and you can see there's almost no difference in their spatial thinking between the two. So the, the bungalow form as it's developing in New South Wales becomes pretty universal. Adding rooms to the colonial cottage or bungalow was initially straightforward before it began to present a structural and a spatial challenge. Now the logical solution for enlarging a small cottage was first to enclose the verandas, but you could also add a room to one end, simply lengthening the structure. Obviously, however, this could only go so far without creating a conga line of rooms. And you get the idea by looking at Roseneath here at Parramatta and imagining the elevation being continued sideways indefinitely. So the first variation instead is the arrangement we see at Elizabeth Farm and also here at Glenfield, where an angled side wing was created, creating an L-shaped plan. This meant that the roof simply turned at 45 degrees over a side wing, while maintaining its necessarily steep pitch and a constant span. At Elizabeth Farm, archeological evidence actually suggests that this L was part of the original design. At Glenfield, which was a house restored by SLM's Endangered Houses Fund, you can also see the typical enclosed ends to each veranda. To create an even larger house, a second returning wing could be added parallel to the first to create a U-shaped roof. And this is what we see at Experiment Farm, where at the rear, the double pitch of the roof is obvious. In this form, the double piled house was possible. The large rooms all still directly related to the exterior with circulation spaces placed at the center. This was the final evolutionary phase of the colonial bungalow. But was the word bungalow actively used in New South Wales? Well, in the opening decades of the 1800s, no, not particularly outside of those who had direct experience of India. When Burwood, for instance, was sold in the 1850s, the word was used more as a real estate hook. It was described as, quote, built in the architecture of the bungalow of the East, drawing and dining rooms with entrance hall, the windows opening onto the veranda. And just a comparison there to an earlier view of Burwood, you can see how French doors have been added at a later date. The first time I've seen the word used to describe Elizabeth Thumb was in 1879 when the painting on the left was, uh, was created and it's titled as Close to Billiards Bungalow. The billiards being tenants of Elizabeth Farm at that time. And the scene on the right with the hammock on the house's eastern veranda certainly captures the relaxed subtropical feel conjured up by the word. And there's a possibility that um, the word is actually used by the personal experience of Robert Ponsonby Staples, the artist who had traveled to New South Wales via Southeast Asia. 
One colonial house, however, built in Sydney's west from 1831 to 32, can truly be called an Indian bungalow. And this is Horsley, as drawn here almost a century later by the architect Heidi Wilson. It was built by Blanche, the daughter of Lieutenant Colonel Johnson, and her husband, George Weston, a lieutenant in the East India Company. Following their 1829 marriage, they traveled to India, returning two years later, living in a large field tent, akin to the one used by Macquarie on his colonial tours, uh, with Indian servants around them while they built their hilltop house. And here it is seen from the north, and you can see it just ticks all the bungalow style boxes, an unbroken roof pitch, a large hall-like room inside with French doors, giving access to deep loggia-like verandas at the front, um, high internal ceilings, it's very pucker indeed. The house was even built by Indian workmen, and it even had that Anglo-Indian icon, the punker swaying over its dining table, complete with a punker waller sitting outside and pulling on the cord. In this view, which could very easily be from an Anglo-Indian hill town, you can see the eastern side of a lighter encircling veranda, which has been enclosed. <clears throat> well, here you see uh, inside the front loggia of the house and on the right, the Jalousi shutters, which open both outwards and have adjustable pivoting blades to finally control the light and airflow on hot days. And the Jalousi mechanism used here was um, imported by Blanche from India. In the plan, you can see the large sitting room opening to front and back to maximize both airflow and light. Next to it, a square dining room and bedrooms to the sides accessed directly without corridors. In the photo, you can see the rear loggia, which is now internal as a further veranda and two extra corner rooms were added to the rear as the house was extended. As a bit of a curiosity, on a circa 1821 drawing by Henry Kitchen for Hambledon Cottage, which was the second residence at Elizabeth Farm, there are several sketched variations on the cottage's basic plan. Now one barely visible and it's circled in red here is an H-shaped six room bungalow plan, conceptually very similar to Horsley. And it also recalls Kitchen's designs for another house, Glen Lee. In the elevation Kitchen also drew for the house, which was most certainly a cottage orné, a faint line indicates that an unbroken bungalow roof line was also considered rather than the final broken pitch. This decision was likely made by MacArthur and carried over to the main house itself a few years later. Kitchen also designed Belgeny at the MacArthur's Camden estate. Since demolished, the details in a surviving sketch allow its interior to be reconstructed and show it to be very much a bungalow, still with the broken pitch, however, common to the MacArthur residences. Horsley Park aside, is the colonial bungalow of New South Wales really the product of direct Anglo-Indian influence? What well, once considered a certainty, this is now heavily debated and in most cases doubted. While there was certainly close contact between the colony and India and designers such as John Watts had certainly worked overseas, to me, the colonial bungalow form can also be viewed as the natural evolutionary descendant of the simple original box-like cottages that lined the streets of Sydney and Parramatta. Limited by the necessary roof pitch needed by a single roof, a two or three room cottage could only extend in depth so far. And with the addition of a sensible encircling veranda and enclosed ends to provide extra rooms, the visual and spatial resemblance to the Indian bungalow was well underway. Thank you. Thank you, Scott. Now, if anybody's got any questions for Scott, please feel free to add them into the Zoom chat. Scott, I was wondering, what can we learn for modern houses from bungalow design in relation to cooling them in summer in an you know, environmentally sensitive way? Well, actually, you've just highlighted one of the key aspects of the, the idea of the bungalow, which is that it's, it makes a response to its environment. So the Anglo-Indian bungalows in India were all about keeping the interior cool, whilst also allowing for light and air to go through the house. Um, 
when you look at descriptions, say, in building magazines in the early 1900s, one of the things they also emphasise is that they respond to place. And by that, they mean they respond very much to the environmental conditions where they're being built. So, yes, it, it, inherent in the concept of the bungalow is this idea about responding to the conditions. Um, and effectively, you're looking at passive solar techniques. There were other, other techniques they could use um, for cooling, sometimes hanging um, wet sheets, for instance, uh, or wet matting around the edges. That would also help to cool uh, cool the breeze. And that's a variation of a technique you see right through, um, from India right through the Middle East, for instance. Thanks, Scott. We've got a few questions in the chat. Um, how many of the houses spoken about today are still standing? Most. Most of them are. Um, Elizabeth Farm, of course, uh, you can come and visit. Now, we reopen. We reopened last week. So, yes, come and visit. Fridays and Saturdays, we're now reopened. Um, Horsley still stands. It's now used um, partly as residence, partly as a reception centre, so it's a private residence. Um, I was lucky enough to visit there a couple of years ago, which is where I got those, uh, those photographs from. Um, a lot of the others are still standing. And fortunately, a lot of the others um, survive, at least in drawings or photographs. Um, I've popped in the chat um, a whole series of um, book titles and um, a web link as well um, that people might be interested in just copying down. Um, Thanks. Yes, that might be particularly interesting. We've got time for one more question. Um, Phillips asked, where does the Californian bungalow come into play in Australian architecture? Oh, well, yes, the California bungalow is one of those sort of major um, building styles that really appears. Um, in the late 1800s um, in America, the bungalow is really making itself felt. And it's got this idea of a casual, a more casual residence, um, less expensive to build, and those ideas as well of responding to climate. Um, in California, then, a particular form starts to appear around that time and into the early 1900s. And it's things like the, the very broad characteristic eave, um, eaves. Um, at the corners of verandas and porches, you'll find those sort of flared sort of pylon shapes. Um, they're a dead giveaway for the bungalow. So it translates across to here as well, where at that time there was also this sort of great growing interest in, um, in, in this idea of, of the bungalow. So that, yeah, that's where it comes from. It's, it is literally, as the name suggests, coming from America. I just saw a comment pop up, someone asking where the, um, the references I've put are. They're in the chat. So if you just open the chat line, you'll find I've, I've popped them all down there. And we might take one last question. Was the flooring mostly uh, those stone flagging I saw on the verandas continued inside or was it pressed dirt? It, it can be depending on, on the economy of the house. Um, you can have, yes, um, an absolute pressed dirt. Um, early... Um, Sorry, they're not, although they're not links. They're, one is a, a link um, spelt out, but the others are all titled. References check to just, books that you'll be able to find. Yeah, they're, they're the list of the books. I'll, I'll check in a moment. Um, when you hear references and descriptions of Anglo Indian houses, they talk about a hard pucker floor. Um, and it's, it's like um, a masonry render, um, like stucco. And it's extremely hard, so it means it can be brushed out very easily because um, there's um, insects in those houses, especially scorpions, uh, was a major concern. So they're able to be kept very clean, and that that kind of floor was um, um, easier to clean. But in Australian houses, no, they're typically going to be um, timber floored. Although the verandas are typically um, in the houses I've been showing would be stone flagged, quite often in say Marulan stone. Well, thank you, Scott. Uh, we'll have to finish for today. But if you'd like to join me next Tuesday at four, we've got a talk on First Fleet Fair, Food and Hunger in the Early Sydney Colony with Dr Jackie Newling. Thanks again, everyone, for joining us and enjoy your evening. Thanks, Scott. Thanks, everyone.